Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning and welcome if you're watching us on video as well. Uh, today, lots of churches across the country are joining together in particular act of prayer in, uh, uh, for Ukraine. And they've asked us to light a candle uh, just to uh, help us to concentrate um, some churches at some places they're doing this together over the town some churches are doing it separately we're just going to light a candle here and then when we have our share time uh, Dick will uh, pray about that so I'm going to look, just light it as we start so we're going to uh, begin our formal time of worship as we sing crown him with many crowns the lamb upon his throne so let's stand while we sing Let's join together and pray. Let's pray. And first of all, I'm going to read an introduction to our prayers. Uh, the first few words of Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart, in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Gracious and compassionate God, 
We come to you this morning to extol you with all of our hearts. Lord, as we join together, we bring this, Lord, as a corporate thing, joining our voices and joining our hearts. But, Lord, very much from an individual point of view, each one of us, Lord, lifting our hearts in praise and worship to you. For, Lord, your works are great. Lord, they are to be pondered by all who delight in them. And Father, we thank you that amidst a busy week, you've given us this time, Lord, when we can ponder on the things that you have done. And this morning, Lord, as we think about the Lord Jesus Christ and why he came and the implication for us, Lord, we want to just dwell on that. Lord, we, we think back to when Jesus came when he was born as a child and we heard those words and Mary pondered these things in her heart. Lord, she held them there dear. She thought carefully about them. And Lord, may we do that as we think about your works and all that you have done. Lord, we've just some day that you are the creator of the rolling spheres. Lord, everything that has been made has been made by you. There is nothing that's been made not by you. And Lord, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's beyond our understanding, beyond our knowledge. But Lord, we, can, we believe that through faith, that this was part of your work. We look back, Lord, as we see your work in bringing your people in that amazing exodus from Egypt. And then, Lord, we see uh, through scriptures the way that you cared for your people, even though they went away from you. The Lord, that you spoke to them through the prophets. And then, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ came. And, Lord, that made it possible for us to have another exodus, as it were, from our sin into freedom through him. And, Lord, this morning we thank you, we praise you, we worship you for all that you have done for us. For you, indeed, Lord, are a great God, and glorious and majestic are your ways. But, Lord, when we see ourselves in the light of that, Lord, we have to say that we are sinners Lord, there are things that we do that fail you. And once again, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, for the times this week when we perhaps said things that we ought not to have done, when we, uh, Lord, have said things through the, for the wrong reason, when we've not acted as we should have done. Lord, give us that desire not to continue in our sin, but to turn away and to turn towards you. Lord, we realise that, that, that the Apostle Paul wrote that we are a new creation, that the old has gone and that the new has come. And so, Lord, may we uh, ask you again for forgiveness for that part of our old lives. And, Lord, lead us afresh in that newness of life that Jesus brings. Lord, hear our prayers this morning, we pray, as we lift them to you, as we raise our voices lord in praise maybe we we'll raise our hands lord we must raise our hearts as it were as we give to you our sincere thanks for your wonderful love and your grace towards us lord we pray that in jesus name amen let's join in the words of the lord's prayer our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let's carry on as we sing two more songs. Uh, first of all, we're going to sing, When I was lost, you came and rescued me. And then we're going to sing straight after that, Lord, I come before your throne of grace. So it's when I was lost, and then Lord, I come before your throne of grace. So let's stand as we worship.
What a faithful God have I. And that first song that we sang there, if you notice, it says, Now I have come into your family. And that's what we're thinking about today. Because before we looked at being part of God's family, and now today we're going to look at the second part of, of that. And we're going to look at why Jesus came. We're going to look at how serious sin is. And we're going to look at what our response needs to be to that. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move on. We're going to have our Bible reading for this morning before we look at the Word. 
and uh, we're, we're still in 1 John, um, we're in 1 John chapter 3, and uh, this morning we're going to read verses 4 through to 10. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through to, to 10. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. That's the word of the Lord for this morning. We're going to pray and then we're going to look at it. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for uh, John who wrote that letter so many years ago. And thank you, Lord, that it's relevant to us in the day and the age and the time and the culture in which we live. Help us, Lord, to uh, discern this morning what you are saying to us and respond as you call us. And Father, we thank you as well that we've had, again, the opportunity to give to the offering. Accept, Lord, our gifts of money, we pray. Lord, money placed in the basket and money also that's been uh, put straight into the bank. But Lord, accept the love of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes I read of children in the royal family and uh, sometimes I hear of uh, complaints. People say, oh, they live a very privileged life, a very privileged life. Now that's probably true. They maybe do live a privileged life. I don't begrudge them that at all. But there must be a time when their parents have to sit them down and tell them, explain that they are going to live a privileged life. But I'm sure that they also have to tell them, with privilege comes great expectation and responsibility, because rights and responsibility go together. Sadly, so many people seem to know their rights or maybe they think they know their rights, including children. I had a child came up to me once and he said, I know my rights. Maybe he did. But what about the responsibility? Do we always see that so as so important? And do we see that rights and responsibility go together? Now, oops, last time, two weeks ago, as we delved into John's letter, we looked at three aspects of being children of God. We looked at being that we can be confident children. We looked that we are loved children and that we are waiting children. And we also saw that we are children of God by right. It is our right to be children of God. John had written in his gospel, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then we finished that week by looking at chapter 3, verse 3 of 1 John, the hope we have in Christ means that we must purify ourselves. So that's how we, we left it. But this morning, as we look at verses 4 to 10, it continues this theme of being children of God. And it includes, again, our responsibilities and what we need to know 
as Christians. Now, we can't possibly look at everything from this because we'd be here a long, long time. Uh, But what I'm going to do is just pick out three things from this short passage that we as Christians must know. And sometimes it's quite frightening when people who are Christians or claim to be Christians and have been in church many years don't know the basics. It really really can be quite frightening. And I, I, I want us to see three things that we must know as Christians. So the first thing is that we must know why Jesus came. We must know why Jesus came. And John clearly shows to us two reasons. And so the first one that we're going to look at is in verse 5, first part of verse 5, you know that he appeared so that he may take, might take away our sins. And we've got to know this. Sometimes uh, I, I watch quiz programmes on the TV and I like quiz programmes and sometimes they say, we asked a hundred people, okay? And I think if we'd said, why did Jesus come? If this was a certain programme, I hope this wouldn't be a pointless answer. I hope that as Christians, we'd be right up there at a hundred people know why Jesus came He came that he might take away our sins. John has written a lot about sin, and he does in this passage. And he makes it clear that this is one of the reasons why Jesus came. And if you were on that programme pointless, and the question was, why did Jesus come? This ought to be the top answer. This ought to be the highest one. Would we be able to answer that? And if we don't know... And I say with great respect, we ought to just carefully examine if we are Christians. Because it's basic that somebody who has put their faith in Christ knows that Jesus came to bring forgiveness. There is no other way. There is no other way by which we can be forgiven. Now, when we've looked at this, we've seen that there is a close connection between John's gospel that he wrote and this first letter. And here, we are taken right back to the very first chapter of the gospel. Because when John the Baptist, in John chapter 1, gospel chapter 1, when he introduced Jesus, this is what we read. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, he's following on from his gospel. If we were to look at the book of Hebrews, that deals with sacrifices. And we go back to the Old Testament and animal sacrifices, and we see there that the priest had to give them day after day after day. But they never dealt fully with sin. But Hebrews 9, 28 just brings it together and it says Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. All those who will trust in him. You see, those animal sacrifices had to be spotless. There had to be no blemish on the animal. And so what was needed would be for a perfect once and for all sacrifice to come. And it was Jesus. He was perfect. He was spotless. He needed to be spotless and without sin. But that verse there that uh, I've just read is only the first part. You know that he appeared that he might take away our sins. And then it goes on to say, and in him is no sin. Because Jesus perfectly fulfilled the requirement for sacrifice. He was without sin. You see, they would examine carefully the animal that was going to be sacrificed. And we see that before Jesus was was killed, he was questioned before Pilate and before the authorities. 
And what did Pilate say? I find no basis for a charge against this man. He was perfect. So the first thing there that we must know that Jesus came to deal with sins. But then in verse 8, the second part, John goes on to say the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Now, would you have given that answer as to why did Christ come? That's what John has written. But let's look at that whole verse. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. From the beginning, right back into the book of Genesis, we see there the devil and his character. He was the one who tempted Eve and so sin entered the world. You see, everything about him is sin his character his nature the way he acts he is the very opposite of christ who was sinless and of a righteous nature and the reason that jesus came was to save the reason that satan came was to destroy they are polar opposites Again in John's Gospel, he wrote, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, he was a deceiver. And John wrote in chapter 5 here, we're going to get to it soon, that the world is under his control. And we saw, didn't we, that the world system, that is, with no acknowledgement of God, is under the control of the evil one. Now, we haven't got time to look uh, in detail at the work of the devil, but we must be w- aware of him. Peter said he is a roaring, like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, he's out to destroy, but he can't, the Christian. Because that's why Jesus came and that's why it's so important that we know he is that roaring lion and we need to know that, we need to be aware of that, but we don't need to be afraid for Jesus came to destroy his work. When did he do it or has he done it yet? Hebrews 2, 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil the way that he destroys the devil work devil's work is exactly the same way as he took away our sins at the cross when jesus says it is finished on the cross and it's not far off Good Friday now, when we're going to celebrate that and remember that, look back to that. It is finished, a cry of triumph. His work was completed. Sins would be dealt with, the devil's work would be destroyed. So you might say, so why the things we are seeing? Why have we had to light a candle this morning to think about Ukraine? Why do we see so much evil in the world? If evil is the work of the devil, and that's what the Bible says, and Jesus came to destroy his work, and that's what the Bible says, how do they fit together? But it's that word again, it's the world. The world without God is still under his control, but he is condemned and defeated. Condemned and defeated. Perhaps you've heard that phrase, he's a dead man walking. What does that mean? It means that the judgment has been passed, his final defeat is certain, but it's not yet come, and that's the devil. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. Final defeat is going to be when Jesus comes again. So that's the first thing we need to be sure of, why Jesus came. To deal with our sins and to destroy the work of the devil. 
What's the second thing that we as Christians must know? Well, John says that it's this. It's the seriousness of sin. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. That means unbridled, unrestrained law-breaking. A disregard of God's ways. Sin is serious. I might have told you that one of the programmes that I really like watching on television is Police Interceptors. <clears throat> it's on Channel 5, I think, at the moment. I particularly like it at the moment because it's about Nottinghamshire Police. I think I've said that before, and we've seen them chasing people through the streets that we used to walk down when we lived there. And so it's kind of, wow, look where they are now, look at that building that they're driving past. But as I look at them, and they're chasing these lawbreakers, often, often it's car chasers, I sometimes look at them and I think, that driver just doesn't care. He doesn't care. He's got total disregard to what he's doing. You know, they drive on the wrong side of the road. They drive wrong side of, of roundabouts. They drive, they just overtake when there's cars coming the other way. They're doing, they're doing 150, 160 miles an hour down the motorway. I've seen them driving the wrong way down the motorway. And then when they are caught, do you know, they seem to sometimes have this so what? So what attitude? Does it really matter? Well, what attitude do we have to sin? If I get caught, I get caught. So what? Or do we see it as sin, as lawlessness, a disregard of God's laws, of God's ways? Sin is serious. Why do we fall into sin? Well, it might be through indifference. Oh, it's not that bad. Sometimes it can be carelessly, not being careful enough about the places that you visit or the people who influence you or what you watch on the TV or what internet pages you view. It might be on purpose. It looks good and it feels good. So does it matter? Whatever the reason, we're guilty. Whatever the reason, we are guilty. Imagine two people drive into a car park and one sees a sign that says no parking here but thinks, oh forget that, I'm going to park there. The other one doesn't see the sign and parks next to him which has committed an offence. The one who didn't realise or the one who deliberately did it. The answer is both, aren't they? Both have committed an offence. You can't park there. And sometimes people try to excuse themselves. I didn't see the sign. Didn't see it. Or they look for the loopholes. And here's a dangerous one. Well, it's just today's culture. It might have been a sin then, but it's not now. Things have changed and we as Christians need to change with them. Now I'm pretty sure that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. That's what the Bible says. And that means in every aspect. So that means that the sins that he died for then is the same as the sin he died for now. So he couldn't have died for something that was a sin then but now isn't. Because he's the same, he never changes. Another thing is we can say, oh, it's just how I am. And I, I've heard this, I've heard this used as an excuse. This, doesn't the hymn say, oh, just as I am, I come. I've heard it as an excuse for sin. Doesn't it mean that God accepts me now as I am? Well, it does, as we come to Christ. But to take that as the whole meaning of the hymn, is totally out of context. For instance, verse 2 says, Just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. It means I'm coming as I am, but I'm coming. I can't wait to get changed. I can't wait for that sin to be forgiven. 
Or verse 5, just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. It's not about, well, I can do what I want, I can come how I want. It's I can come as I am, but so that I can be changed. I don't want to be like this any longer. I, am, I believe that only God can cleanse and forgive me. Sin is serious. Jesus came to forgive sin by giving his life, and that's how serious it is. So the first two things, that Christians, we as the family of God, part of being a child of God, we must know, first of all, why Jesus came. And we must know how serious sin is. And the third thing is this. We must know how we must live. If, see, if we know why Christ came, and if we know what it costs, and if we see the seriousness of sin, how can we continue in a life of sin? What, is, what did John write? No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And then in verse 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Now we saw in previous work, weeks how all of us sin. In chapter 1 it says there, we can't say that we don't sin. And so again we ask ourselves, so how does this fit then? Well, the meaning of this word is to keep on sinning. That habitual sin, a kind of a settled, habitual thing, a continuing, persisting thing. Somebody called Plummer said, although the believer sometimes sins, yet not sin, but opposition to sin is the ruling principle of their life. Somebody else said, the believer may fall into sin, but he will not walk in it. It's about the direction of travel. See, our Christian life must be one of growing closer to God and aiming for holiness. But we are not by ourselves in this. We're not by ourselves. God's seed remains in them, says John. We have been born of God. Now, there's been loads of talk about what that means about God's sin. There's been lots of discussion. Is it God's nature is in us? Or is it the seed as in the word of the gospel? Like in the uh, gospels, the seed was the word. Or is it the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> now, I'm not going to discuss it now. And in a way, it doesn't actually matter. But all of them are true. Because when we are being born of God, what it means, it's not a natural thing. It's not a natural birth. This is what can keep us from habitual sin. How do we know if we're living in this sin? <clears throat> well, we must ask, does it concern us? Or do we excuse ourselves? Or do we <clears throat> just ignore what we're doing? Are we overwhelmed with grief? when we think about what we've done. Do we feel convicted? That's the right response, of course it is, as long as we, it leads to confession and repentance. <coughs> Sorry. In our minds at the moment, for so many people, is the cost of power, cost of heating, electricity and gas. It's going through the roof, isn't it? And some people are really struggling and, and I read of many who are choosing not to use their heating because of th the tremendous cost. And of course, our hearts go out to them, don't they, with some of the stories that we may have heard. But God offers to us, through our new birth, through his seed within us, the power to overcome sin. And we need to choose, I am going to use God's power within me because the cost has already been paid. You see, people who, who are scared of putting the heating on, they are worried because of when the bill comes, 
what will it be? And if you've got a smart meter now, you can have one of these things in your house, can't you? And it says, this is how much you've spent today. Ha, ah, it was Friday when I saw it, going up and up and up. Worried about what bill has come, will come. We don't need to worry about the bill because the bill has been paid by Christ. We can use all that God has given to us. The cost has already been paid this morning we are going to share in communion and we're going to remember christ who came to take away our sins serious as they are and who came to destroy the work of the devil <clears throat> and we will examine ourselves again but we are children of god we're children of god who need to know these things but we are children of God who are waiting for his return when we shall be like him that's what we looked at two weeks ago we are waiting for his return we shall be like him we shall see him and as a consequence how can we possibly go on living in sin let's pray together Lord, I thank you for your word here. Thank you that we can be your children, children of God. Lord, some, in some ways, this has been really basic this morning. The things that we need to know, we need to know why Christ came. We need to make sure that we know how serious sin is and we need to know how we need to live. But Lord, thank you for reminding us again or perhaps telling us for the first time Lord, as we move now to a time of holy communion, we pray that it might be a time when we carefully reflect on all that you have done and our response to it. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The hymn that we sang earlier, the song said, Lord, I come before your throne of grace. And we're going to sing another song now about God's throne. And it's before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Before the throne of God above. So let's stand while we sing.
I'm going to read these words that we read so often when it's Holy Communion. 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. So we're going to do that. We're going to examine ourselves. We're going to remember Christ who came to take away our sins and to destroy the work of the devil, which he did at the cross. And we're going to examine ourselves again to make sure that we know the seriousness of sin. But when we see the seriousness of it, it gives us a greater love for the Saviour who died for us. So let's do that and let's make sure that we're in the right relationship with him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that the reason that Jesus came was to take away our sins and to destroy the work of the devil. Lord, that happened at the same time, at the cross. At the cross, where we can find forgiveness. At the cross, where we can know new life. Father, thank you for all that Jesus did for us. Thank you for his blood that was shed and his body that was broken for us. And Lord, now as we eat and drink, we eat and drink in thankfulness to him. We eat and drink remembering all that Christ has done. Remembering how serious sin is, but how much he loved us that we might be forgiven. And we drink, Lord, and eat looking forward to the time when he will come again and we shall be like him. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink from it, all of you. So we'll take the cups and we'll save them and drink together. By his wounds, my healing came as I called upon his name. This cup represents the blood of Christ which was shed for us. Let's drink in thankfulness. Father God, the cross makes such, such a huge and wonderful difference in our lives. Lord, it was through the cross that we came from the old life into the new, from darkness into light, from death to life, from being strangers and foreigners to being your children. Through our faith, 
in the Christ and his saving blood. And Father, as we have shared together, Lord, we pray that as we go from this place, we shall be able to share with others the wonderful news that to all who receive him, to all who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. What a wonderful thing it is when we have the assurance of new life. What a wonderful thing it is when we can share together in communion. And we're going to sing about that assurance that we can have ourselves. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. What a foretaste of glory divine. So let's stand as we sing our final hymn. Let's pray. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Lord, may we go through this week and be able to praise you, not just through every day, but through the whole week. Lord, whatever happens, knowing that nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us both this day and forevermore. Amen.